Perfect. All right. Thank you guys so much for coming back. I hope you guys are well caffeinated after that coffee break. Uh, and I hope you guys are doing great. And um, how many of you guys here are developers? Awesome. Great. And uh, how many of you guys have heard of Euphoria in the past? Great. Awesome. All right, cool. So Euphoria is PTC's augmented reality brand. And there are a couple of, uh, there's a handful of different uh, products under that brand. Uh, two of these are Vuforia Studio and Vuforia Engine. Vuforia Engine focuses on developers and it helps developers put content into the real world by using advanced computer vision and the content can be placed either into environments or onto objects. Now, when it comes to objects, Vuforia helps developers put content in a lot of different things. We can put content onto view marks, onto images, onto product packaging. And there's a lot of people that have been creating really amazing experiences using this technology. Now, what all of these objects have in common is that all of these objects are dependent on intricate visual detail on the objects, right? So what we call natural feature tracking in computer vision. But what about objects that don't have a lot of intricate visual detail? Cars have been notoriously tricky to augment with the reflective surfaces and transparent glass. Consumer appliances, for instance, they're, they're made and designed with an augmented reality in mind, right? They're made for a specific function. 3D printing is becoming incredibly popular for prototyping, and people want to take these prototypes to life using augmented reality. And of course, we have industrial equipment and engines and motors and things like that that have all traditionally have been really tricky to augment and really tricky to work with within AR. And that's why last year, before introduced model targets, which allows us to put content onto a whole new class of objects. Model targets allows us to Sorry, uh, model targets allow us to augment objects based on the, their geometry, not necessarily their visual features. And because model targets are detected by shape, the color of the object can change over time, right? So if you want to augment an object or a piece of uh, construction equipment and it gets dirty or messy because it's on a construction site, you'll still be able to augment that because we're taking into account the geometric detail and geometric features of the object. So quick little video here of here of uh, model targets in action. So as you can see here, my colleague is, is uh, pointing the device to, towards this toy uh, bicycle, this motorcycle. We have this outline that the user needs to align, and we'll be talking uh, more about how that works later on. But the idea here is that uh, the user will sort of orient themselves to the object, and then once we're there, we can lock onto it, and we can put content, to content onto the object. And of course, in Typical, traditional v fashion, we work on, it's a cross-platform solution, and we work on all of the major devices, including HoloLens. For a very specific list of devices, if you have questions about devices, please feel free to check out our website for more information. All right, so model targets. Now let's talk a little bit more about the workflow of what it takes to actually bring something like this to life. The first thing that we're going to do is we need to source the model. And if you're working with, um, with a client and they have the, um, the CAD models there, you can work with them and get that source that model that way. Uh, you can also scan it, right? The photogrammetry is getting really popular and really good. That's, a, that's an opportunity there to use uh, that kind of tech. Uh, a lot of models are available in the community. And, uh, and lastly, if, if none of those are there, you can always create the model from scratch. We can take all of these models and use it as part of our technology, as part of model targets. Next thing you're going to do, once you have your model, you need to do a little bit of prep work. So you might either have to reduce the number of polygons, you might need to re remove some articulating parts, some transparent surfaces. So there's a little bit of prep work that you need to do. And at this point, once you have the model in this stage, you're going to go ahead and take this model and put it through one of our tools, and we're going to generate what we call a detection pose. Once you generate your detection pose, you're going to go ahead and generate a, a database, a model target database that creates a special data structure that V4 Engine understands and then allows it to detect the object. Once you have that package, you're going to go ahead and import it into your favorite development environment. So that's Unity, that's Xcode, that's Visual Studio, Android Studio, all of those platform um, development environments that we support. 
And then lastly, you're going to make your amazing experiences using model targets. All right, so out of all of these steps, two of these steps involves a tool called the model target generator, the M what we call the MTG. And I'm going to go through the workflow of what it takes to do in, model in, in MTG. It's going to be pretty quick, um, but if you want have any questions or um, curious about any specific details, feel free to reach out to us downstairs at our booth. So the first thing that we're going to do here is we're going to specify a, a project name. And then once after we specify our project name, we're going to go ahead and browse over and select our CAD model. So in this case here, I'm taking a, a model of the Viking lander from the NASA website. I'm going to create our project. We process it. And then you see the model loaded. And there it is. And I'll explain to why it's sideways just now. Now, because most um, modeling environments and authoring environments have a different coordinate system, you just need to give us a hint of what the up vector is, so that way we know which way to orient the object. And now at this point here, what we're going to do is that we're going to sort of manipulate the, um, the, the view of the object and find a position that is going to be comfortable for the user to interact with, with the object. And then we're sort of just tweaking it around, figuring it out, and then we set the detection position. So a couple of things to notice here is that the position right now, it's about like 3 quarters up. So this is something that I would expect you to use on a tabletop. And the other thing to notice on this slide here is that on the very right side, we have this sort of black and white outline. And that's what we call a guide view. And a guide view is something that we generate for developers to use as a way to uh, help the user experience when working with model targets. And, we'll, uh, and the idea here is that you want to use this, this guide view as a way to orient the user, so that way they're approaching the, the object from the correct angle. OK, so now once we're at this point here, we're going to go ahead and generate the target. So we're just going to click on the Generate Target button. And now what it's doing is that it's going through the object, looking at all the geom geom geometry data, potentially optionally texture data, and it's extracting all that information and generating a database. It's generating a database in a specific location. And uh, in, a in, a, in a couple of steps, we're going to see that database come back. So we're going to import the database later. Now, like I mentioned before, we support a lot of different development environments. In this case here, we're going to use Unity because a lot of our, a lot of our developers use Unity in, the, in our community. So the first thing that we're going to do here is a couple of quick setup steps. We're going to go ahead into the Unity options, and we're going to enable before engine inside of the XR settings. And that's what we're doing here. And then we're going to go into the game object menu, and we're going to create our AR camera. And it's also going to need to import some, some information here. But what's important to notice to know about the AR camera is that the AR camera not only is going to represent your camera inside of your scene, it's also going to represent the camera of the device itself. So then what we do is we remove the default camera in Unity. We go, go back over to our menu, and we select Model Target. And now we have our Model Target uh, game object inside of our scene. Now we're going to go ahead and, and import that same database that we just created a step ago, right? So here it is. Here's that package that was generated. And we're going to go ahead and, and open it and load it into Unity. And that's what we see here. We import the files. And once it's done, you can go back to your model target game object and select the database you just generated. And as you can see, you, you can see here, we see the Viking lander. Now, for those of you guys who are familiar with Euphoria, and many of you are, because I saw a lot of hands up, you'll know that when you're working with something like an image target or a multi-target in Unity, it's really easy. You have a game object, and then you put your digital content relative to that, to that target. And it's exactly the same way here. We have this model. We give you a hint of what the model looks like inside of Unity. That way, you can put your content around it. So if you want to put um, instructions or you want to put some kind of um, information for the user, if you want to put some kind of interesting shader on it, make it look like it's, it's you know, glowing, or if you want to make it look like it's dissolving or there's lava, you can do all that here. So that's a general gist of the workflow of what it takes. Obviously, I skipped a lot of steps when it came to prepping the model. But now let's look at some, some of the examples of some of our customers using model targets today um, very successfully. And uh, this is actually a really fun project that I, I really love to talk about. Um, so this year, uh, Mattel celebrate, it celebrates the 50th anniversary of Hot Wheels. Now, if any of you guys are like me, you guys probably played with something like this growing up. 
but it was not nearly as awesome as this, right? You had a very simple track, and then you have the um, you have the cards rotate around it. So what they're doing here is that they're they're taking augmented reality technology along with a Bluetooth technology, and they're creating this really interesting gameplay experience that takes a classic racing game and sort of adds in like a new generation of of tech to it, and it creates some really uh, really fun fun races. Uh, the way that I like to think about this is that you're taking Mario Kart type game mechanics and bringing it to the real world. Ask Mercedes was launched earlier. Let's play that video. Was launched earlier this year, and it is a Ask Mercedes is a, is a digital user's manual for for consumers. So the idea here is that you obviously you have the car, and then you load this app on, you align to your center um, center console, and now you can explore all of the features of the car. And now this is becoming a very very popular use case where manufacturers want to give their consumers a new way of learning about their products in a way that they're familiar with and a way that they're comfortable with, especially with our um, our digital generation. Here we have another example with cars. In this case here, we have a, a car um, customizer where you sort of get to change the color of the car. It's actually made from um, some awesome guys, uh, Visionary777. They're downstairs. I highly recommend you guys check them out. Um, so the idea here is that we're putting on this decal, right, this fast and furious decal onto this object. And what I want to point out here is that the, the tracking and the the tech here has to be so accurate that it provides this really convincing experience, right? The content really sticks to the object, and if it wasn't for the fact that it was so sticky, um, it wouldn't be a, a convincing experience. It wouldn't be a, an amazing experience like it is. Now, I'm sure you guys are always thinking to yourselves, you know, I'm going to create some awesome experiences, and I want to get up there, and I want to be one of those videos. So now we're going to talk about some best practices to help you guys get there. So the first thing we're going to talk about here is what makes a good physical object. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is that we need objects, we like objects, to have a lot of geometric detail. So things like monitors or basketballs don't have, a lot, don't have enough geometric information in there for model targets to work properly. As with a lot of computer vision, you're looking for sharp edges, right? If you have a lot of rounded edges, um, the, uh, the experiencers won't perform as well. You also want to keep the number of moving parts to minimum. If you have a lot of articulating parts, that can cause some confusion with our algorithms. And consider the surface area. And what I mean by that is that if you have a very skinny or thin object, it doesn't actually have a lot of visual information there for the algorithms to work with. It's also worth pointing out that the, the current algorithms for model targets are tuned and they're calibrated for objects that are fairly static, meaning if you have an object that's moving around a lot, the algorithms might have a, a tough time uh, making sure that it's that it's it's um, make sure that the, uh, the augmentation is fixed. The last thing I want to point out here is you do want to avoid extremely shiny or transparent surfaces, if at all possible. So that's what makes a good physical object, but what makes a good digital model? So, first. Shoot for under 100K poly to keep your frame rates reasonable. Now, this isn't, isn't the, the, the model that you're going to render to the user. right? If you want to render something to the user, you can render at much higher polys. But for generating your target, you want to make sure that you reduce the poly count down. It's also worth noting that it's, very, it's highly dependent on the device that you're working with. And what I mean by that is that if you know that your target audience are all using very, very modern phones, iPhone 10s and such, you can probably push that up a lot higher. But if you're looking to sort of get a really broad a number of devices, or if you're targeting HoloLens, you want to reduce the poly count so that way you can maintain a uh, reasonable frame rate. Uh, another really great trip, <laughs> really great tip, is to actually use different materials for different parts of the object. So. And I'll show an example of this later. But the idea here is that even though your object might be all, or your final uh, object might be all one uniform color, you can actually 
uh, inside of your model, change some of the materials around, and I will give the engine, before engine, some hints as to how to actually find the different parts of the object. You also want to remove any, any unnecessary geometry. So this includes any kind of moving parts, articulating parts. Also, remove any glass, right? So if you're working with cars, um, we found that generally works a lot better if you remove the, 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 the mesh of the glass. And of course, you always want to make sure that you use one of our supported uh, formats, but we're always increasing the, the formats that we support. All right, now what makes a good detection position? So as I mentioned before, the detection position is the approach which the user will use to interact with that object. So the first thing that you want to do is you want to make sure that the object, um, sorry, the detection position contains a lot of geometric details. So if you have a couple of different angles that you can look at the object, and if one has a lot fewer details, try aiming for the one that has more uh, geometric information. Uh, another good tip, and this is something that Ask Mercedes did, was to, if you have a very large object, try augmenting a smaller portion of that larger object. And what I mean by that is that what Mercedes did was they have this entire dashboard that they want to augment and put content on to, to train their or to teach their, um, their consumers. Instead of trying to understand and detect the entire dashboard, what they're doing is that they're focusing on the center console. They know that the center console has a lot of detail and that it's easy to recognize. So the user sits down in the car. It's a naturally feel like it's a natural feel. It's a naturally feeling position. Um, it feels natural to the user. They sit down. They turn on their device. They point at the center console, and now everything's augmented, right? So you don't have to think about the entire object. You can think about a smaller portion that makes sense to your user, and then go from there. The other thing to worth pointing out is if you're looking at uh, vehicles like cars or other types of objects, consider using an angled or three quarters pose. So if you have a position that you can see two sides, like the, the um, one side and the front, or like the left of the front or the top and the front, um, consider that over, a po uh, over an angle that's just looking straight on, like a cardinal position, cardinal angle. So you know, avoid a straight on um, f like front, fr <coughs> excuse me a front angle or a side angle. Excuse me. All right, lighting is extremely important when it comes to computer vision. And it's no different with model targets. As usual, what we recommend is an evenly lit area with diffuse lighting. If you have very bright or dark spots, that can manipulate uh, the exposure on the camera of the device causing some uh, unintended consequences. And the lighting should also remain fairly static. Stay away from disco balls or anything that's really, um, really flashing all the time. And in general, if you can, um, it's always preferred to have stable indoor lighting over really dynamic outdoor lighting uh, as it changes a lot throughout the day. All right, so I find it really awesome that model targets works with objects that can be several meters big. Now, smaller objects can be a little bit trickier. And the reason why is not necessarily the tech, but you'll notice on devices, they can have a harder time focusing on objects that are less than 10 centimeters big. So if you have a very small object, what you'll probably run into is that the camera will start to pump the, the autofocus and will have a harder time focusing, and that can really ruin the experience. In general, it's also best for you to try to fit as much of the object as possible into your, fr into your field of view of the camera. And one thing that we like to mention is that if you have a very tall object, you know, encourage the user or guide the user to be using a portrait mode. If you have a very wide object, encourage them to use landscape mode so that way you can get as much of the object and as much of that visual information into the camera frame as possible. It's also, as you go through the process, it's also really important for you to watch out for your, for your scale. Um, all, of these, all of this tech nowadays uses um, inertial sensors, which have a scale. So you want to make sure that the scale that you're working with remains consistent throughout the experience, meaning that uh, you set up your, your model target with the right scale, and then you use the right scale within your, um, within your application as well. All right, some more quick design considerations. Uh, as always, when any time, when you, whenever you're talking about UX design, you really want to consider the fact that um, you want to provide as much information to the user as possible. So if you're, um, 
if you're having a hard time detecting something or if you're switching different modes, make sure that you bubble up all that, all that information up to the user so that way they always know what's going on. One of the worst things you can do is leave the user in a state where they don't know what's happening. Right? That's, that, can be really, um, that can be confusing and that can infuriate users. Uh, one of my colleagues mentioned a, a great idea, which is to pair model targets with view marks. So model targets obviously allows you to de detect and determine a specific type of object, while a view mark, because it allows you to detect a um, get information like serial number, you can actually figure out the specific instance of that object. Lastly, we really want to encourage you guys to experiment. Try this out. This is new technology. It's very exciting. There's a lot of opportunity. And we want to know what you guys are working on. And we want to know what you guys are doing, doing with it and what kind of use cases you guys are tackling. All right, so quick quiz. Uh, I know you guys probably didn't expect this coming in this morning, but I promise this will be fun. OK, so um, here we have two 3D printed objects. Uh, Benji, for those of you guys who are 3D printing enthusiasts, might know it. We also have the Millennium Falcon. So the way that we're going to do this here is I'm going to point at an object. You guys put your hands up if you think this is the one that would augment better or work better with model targets. Or, and, or you, if you don't think so, you put your hand up on the, uh, the other object. So who here thinks that, that Benchy here would be a better model? So the boat on the left. All right, a couple of you. How many of you guys think the, that the Millennium Falcon? All right, no fooling you guys. Yep, that's right. So Benchy, it's small, right? The default, uh, default size is pretty small, so that could cause some focus issues. It also has a lot of rounded edges and not a ton of visual detail, especially when you compare it to the Millennium Falcon. All right, here we have um, two of the Viking models. Uh, who here thinks that the one on the left would be a better candidate? All right, who thinks B would be a better candidate? Awesome, exactly. And the reason for this, again, uh, if you can actually put different materials on the different parts, it can actually aid in the process of, um, you can actually give hints to, to the before, before engine in distinguishing the various parts. All right, so lighting. We're talk now we're talking about the environment. We have these two beautiful Japanese-inspired living rooms. Um, and then we have uh, room A and room B. How many of you guys think that room A would make a better place for, for, a, for model targets? All right, how many of you guys think B? You guys are really good. OK, so the idea here is that we have these gorgeous, beautiful windows that are letting a lot of light in. So throughout the day, the experience could change dramatically. And in B, we have what looks to be pretty evenly lit, diffuse lighting. There's a couple hot spots uh, next to that painting that could cause some, some trouble, but it looks, in general, looks really good. All right, so apologies in advance. I know that, that we're in Munich, and we don't have any European cars up here. Um, but on the left here, we have, the, um, we have a Chevy Bolt, and on the right, we have a Corvette. How many of you guys think that the Bolt would make a better model target? All right, how many think the Corvette? All right, so this is a really tricky one. <laughs> It's actually the, the, the bolt, and the reason why is that it's a little bit tricky to notice, but the, the Corvette is on a rotating platform. So what's going to happen is that the, the object is going to rotate as you're trying to lock onto it, and you're going to have some trouble. So you could, couldn't be that easy, right? All right, so here we have two different approaches um, of the Millennium Falcon model uh, that I played with. How many of you guys think that A would make a better, uh, better guide view? All right, how many B? OK, yeah, you guys are paying attention. Exactly. So here, um, not only are we getting this 3 quarters view, but there's a lot of visual detail there for us to work with. OK, so uh, I know I'm running close on time, so I'm just going to try to do this really quick. Um, so obviously, we're always improving our model targets technology. Uh, we just released 7.5 a couple weeks ago. And with that, we introduced edge tracking. And that makes us so that way the tracking is even more robust, and we can even work on even more objects. So we're really excited to see what you guys do with this. A little bit further out, uh, probably in our next release, we are working on model targets, the next generation model targets, where we can detect multiple models from multiple angles. And what you'll see here is that there's no guide view. And then once, you, once it sees the, um, the object, it will put in the guide view of that particular angle. And then we're going to go to another object. And then you'll sort of see that repeat over and over again. And there it is. And then you sort of align to it, and you're there. Now look at the, pay attention to this third one. This third one is really quick. But the time between the, the, when the guide view shows up and when the augmentation happens, it's really fast. And that's our goal. We want to make it so that way you guys can look at an object 
and it augments right away. Model targets is available today in Vuforia, the current version of Vuforia 7.5. We encourage you guys to check it out. You guys can either download it, it's, in, it's integrated into Unity, or you guys can download it from our website. Um, we also have a ton of samples for developers on our website. We also have samples available in the Unity Asset Store. I encourage you guys to check that out. If you guys are really itching to use uh, functionality that we're working on that's not publicly released yet, you can join our innovator program. Uh, you can either stop by our booth to get more information about that, or you can visit our website. And that is it. That's all I have for you guys. I think we have some time for questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Vinny. That was excellent. Uh, yeah, we do actually have some time for questions. And we can walk around probably have one or two. Hi. Uh, two questions, actually. Uh, the first thing, uh, the black and white uh, curvature map, the, the review map of the model target, is it kind of the representation like uh, at the image targets we have these ratings? Uh, is it kind of a rating? So, so as many lines I get, as better it is? So now, right now, we don't have really good ratings. I think that's something that we're looking into for future versions. We understand that's something that people are looking for. The tricky bit is that the, the technology is also a lot more different, so it's a little bit harder to understand ahead of time uh, exactly how things are going to perform. That's why we really encourage people to try things out. Um, I know I've personally been really impressed sometimes by I, like somebody, like one of our customers talks to us and says, oh, we're going to try to implement this. And I'm like, Psh, that's never going to work. And they're like, no, no, it works. Like, here it is. Here's a video. And it works amazingly. Um, so I think we're still working through the, some of those. But right now, I don't believe we have a rating system yet. But that's something that we're, we're, we're trying to see if that's something that's feasible. OK. And the other thing is, do I have to use photogrammetry to create the models to get the the true, the real uh, curvature map? Or is it OK if I uh, do the uh, modeling uh, as good as I can and it would also work? So most, most, uh, most of the successful cases, they're working with CAD models to, that they, that they right acquired yeah. from the manufacturer or from somewhere else. That's generally where you're going to get the best, best performance. Uh, I definitely have seen photogrammetry work. Um, but I think to answer your question is that the, the texture doesn't matter as much. If you do have texture data, it should match as much as possible. Uh, the color does not matter. We try to ignore the color as much as possible. So when I say texture, I mean um, like I information in the texture that's beyond just the color, beyond just the RGB value, so the contrast and things like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yep, absolutely. Yep, sorry. <laughs> Just uh, a quickly question: Is uh, where is the roadmap for the for tracking uh, uh, object uh, that uh, are mo mobi mobile object? Um, so let's take that offline. I can't speak exactly to things that we haven't announced yet. Um, that's something that you know we're we're always working on improving our technology in general. Um, but I don't have any specific information about things like articulating objects. What uh, what I can say is that there's a lot of tr a lot of tricks and a lot of things that you can do with objects that do articulate. Uh, the first thing that you can do is just omit those model omit those parts of the model and try to focus on the thing that's static is, is static as much static as possible, and that would generally works really well. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I actually pretty much had the same question. Um, I want to track something that I'm holding in my hand. Maybe moving around a bit. Is that ever going to be possible? Um, if it's ever going to be possible, yeah. uh, that's <laughs> well. Is there is there like a, I mean, it doesn't seem to work too well right now. So, uh, so, so you're right. So it's it, it like I said before, the the algorithms are tuned for very static <laughs> objects, and that's mostly because of the use cases that we're working with and we're targeting. If you have a very specific use case, come talk to us about your use case, and then we can try to see what we can do. Uh, but the use cases that we're looking at right now is mostly for like industrial equipment, for cars, for things that are fairly static. Um, but yeah, we'd love to hear what, what you're working on and what you're sort of build, dreaming to build. Hi. Oh, over here. No, it's OK. Yeah, we have time for one more. Um, is it possible to have um, <coughs> multiple starting angles, or is it just possible to have like one initial angle? So the current version that we have today uh, has one, one angle. Uh, you can switch out your data sets internally 
to have multiple angles, but you'll probably need to pair that with something else, either like a <coughs> user-driven UI that you sort of know what angle you're working with, or something else like a like a image target or a view mark. Um, but like I mentioned before, we are working on tech that should be within our next release, where you can define multiple angles as well as multiple objects. That's Thank something you. that's that I showed that video, and I can try to show it again. I can sh we can sh we can show you. We have a demo of that in our in our in our booth. So stop by and check it out. We have a handful of demos of of um, our next generation of model targets.